Eleanor Rigby died in the church and was buried along with her name. Sitting in an English garden waiting for the sun. In my Sony catalog is all the Beatles music, um, all of, you know, Little Richard's music. I own uh, Sly and the Family Stone. I, I own such a volume of so many, I own Elvis, so many Elvis songs, and it's a huge catalog. It's very valuable. It's worth a lot of money, and there is a big fight going on right now as we speak about that. Now, I can't say whether or not. I can't comment on it. There's a lot of conspiracy. I'll say there's a lot of conspiracy going on as we speak. That this is Sergeant Pepper's. We hope you will enjoy the show. Yeah! What's going on, guys? JD here. Welcome back to History in the Mix. Season 2. We're finally here. We've got some new stuff. We're going more rustic, more rugged, more old this time around. As you can tell, we've got the borders in the History in the Mix vinyl. Records vinyl is going to be a big big uh, big thing this season a lot of vinyl reviews I'm planning on doing but today we're gonna to be talking about Michael Jackson purchasing the ACV catalog which uh, holds the Beatles music some of Elvis's music and many 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 artists but today we're gonna to be taking mainly a look at the Beatles now as that awesome intro uh, that actually is a commercial for a thing called Tidal and uh, I kind of stole it I did the sound mixing um, but the animation and stuff is done by that company and their link is uh, down below, but it looked really cool, and so I used it. Now, before we talk about the catalog, I want to uh, do some rapid-fire MJ news uh, for you guys. First, I want to talk about this uh, brand new thing that I discovered uh, last week. It's called Quid. It's like this game on, 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 on Apple, and I think it's coming to Android. You can get it on Android right now. And they have a brand new Michael Jackson feature. Now, Quid is this game with trading cards and stickers and GIFs and it's, it's really cool. Basically, it's digital trading cards. So right now you can go get uh, brand new Michael Jackson trading cards, which look sweet. And I, uh, they're, you know, they're all HD. And I think some of them are actually new images. As you can see here, the silhouette and uh, a few other ones are brand new or at least new to HD. Uh, so please go give the app uh, a download. The links are down below. Now, in the recording of this, tomorrow is the Super Bowl. And uh, Michael Jackson is also going to be featured in the Super Bowl. Uh, with this commercial for Pepsi, and I'll play you guys a little bit. And I'm also going to play you guys a little extended bit where, as you can see, Back to the Future up there, the DeLorean is also in there, so I kind of marked out a little bit. Uh, I'll play that uh, for you guys now. This is the Pepsi that's back from the future. This is the Pepsi that Britney once popped. And this one is for the king of pop. This is the Pepsi for those who are forever fun. This is the Pepsi for every generation. So today's episode puts me at odds between my two favorite artists of all time, Michael Jackson and Paul McCartney. But I'm, I'm covering the story anyway. So <sighs> I've talked about it in my favorite songs video that Say Say Say, uh, the Michael Jackson and Paul McCartney song is one of my favorite songs of all time. Um, obviously it's Michael Jackson and Paul McCartney, what am I not going to love about that? But also, uh, they just look so happy and it's just a fun song. <laughs> Michael and Paul met when Paul wrote Girlfriend, a song which you guys may know from the Off the Wall album. McCartney thought of Girlfriend as a song that Michael might like to record and mentioned this to him at a party in Hollywood. Michael said in his autobiography, Moonwalk, quote, The Off the Wall album was originally going to be titled Girlfriend. Paul McCartney always tells the story about me calling him up and saying that we should write some hits together. I saw Paul for the first time at a party on the Queen Mary, which is docked in Long Beach. His daughter, Heather, got my number from someone and gave him a call to invite me to this big party. She liked our music and we got to talking. Michael stated in interviews with the music press in the 1970s that he was a big fan of the Beatles and the chance to record a Paul McCartney original helped to inspire his next project, which was Off the Wall. However, McCartney, due to multiple pushbacks, ended up recording it himself. With Wings, a band that I love, I love their stuff, Band on the Run, one of my favorite albums of all time. And they actually uh, recorded it themselves and put it on their album called London Town. And 
honestly, well, Michael did it better, but let's get more into the story. Quincy Jones, the producer of Off the Wall, heard the song randomly and to again quote Michael from his book, quote, Quincy walked up to me one day and said, Michael, I've got a song that's perfect for you. He played Girlfriend for me, not realizing, of course, that Paul had written it for me originally. When I told him, he was astonished and pleased. And they were right, Michael would do amazing things with this song. And so Girlfriend made it onto Off the Wall. London Town, Paul's album, sold around 1 million copies. No small feat, but Off the Wall sold, and has sold, uh, more than 20 million copies worldwide. The two hit it off after this and spent loads of time together. They wrote a number of duets and watched cartoons, apparently. Out of this came Thriller's The Girl Is Mine and Paul McCartney's The Man, but also came one of my favorite songs of all time, as mentioned earlier, Say Say Say. During the filming for the music video for Say Say Say, Michael was at his peak. Keep this in mind, guys. Thriller just came out. Uh, I'm not for sure, but I think Motown 25 has already happened. Um, he's a big, big, big deal. And uh, with Paul at this time, Wings was not doing good. They were releasing stuff like London Town, which only sold a million copies, and he's a beetle, all right? One million copies is like an insult. So I was reading something on a Spotify that said uh, Paul McCartney's era in the 80s was saved by these duets with Michael Jackson. That's why Paul stayed relevant in the 80s, and I don't like to think of it like that. I, li I like to think it's Paul doing his own thing, but I can't deny that these duets are some of the reason Paul floated in the 80s, along with his duet with Stevie Wonder, Ebony, and Ivory. Behind the scenes, Michael asked McCartney how he could smartly invest his newly earned money. Paul then explained the profitable nature of music publishing. You were the guy who said to Michael Jackson, you should get into publishing. Isn't that great? Yeah. I love the irony. And he bought all your songs. Yeah. And you've said to him, listen, I'll give you fair market value. Let me buy my songs. I want to own them. Mm. And he won't do it. And it is true. He did ask me. He said, you know, got some advice, Paul? Yeah. I told him, took him aside and said, diddle doodle diddle doodle, -doodle, doodle and think about getting into music publishing. And I thought he was joking. He said, oh, I'm going to get yours. Well, I went, oh, he <laughs> slapped sure him you on are. the back. Right, right, right. Good one. You know, I thought that was a joke. And then I just got wrong up and said, he's got yours. With the help of his attorney, John Branca, who we hate now, and I made a video on. Um, okay, so before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about John Branca. John Branca came into Michael's career early, early on. Um, and he's hated now because he runs the estate, but you, you, you've got to have some respect for John Branca, especially what he did before. Without John Branca, there would be no thriller video. Uh, because MTV at the time did not want to uh, finance a thriller video and John Branca stepped in and came up with the ideas and they got the money for it. So I think John Branca, just because he's in the estate now and did some stuff now that we don't like, obviously, I don't like him, but you've got to respect him for what he did in the past while Michael was alive. Michael bought the rights to some 60 songs that he enjoyed to dance to as a little toe dip in the water. In 1984, around the time of the Victory Tour, Jackson saw that the music publishing company ATV was for sale. Almost coincidentally, ATV owned the rights to the Beatles catalog, as well as 4,000 other songs and a library of sound effects. Before even thinking about being in the running, Branca contacted John Lennon's widow, Yoko Ono, who ran Lennon's estate at the time. She told them that she was not interested in teaming up with Paul McCartney to purchase ATV and get their songs back. Ono also reportedly gave her blessings for Jackson to own the songs. Branca then asked McCartney's lawyer if McCartney wanted to buy ATV first, but his lawyer said the catalog was too expensive, but this wasn't really the case. Paul McCartney wrote those songs for free, and he's talked about it in interviews and I'll play a clip later, but Paul McCartney wrote those songs for free with John Lennon. Um, they were for fun, and to buy those songs back, now that they're iconic and, uh, you know, pay a million dollars for them, there's just no point in it. Like, sure, there's a nice payday, but that's like me buying all my videos back. When I made them, I put in the hard work, I did them, I mixed them, I played bass on them, and now you're having to buy them back for a million dollars, and that just didn't sound good with Paul. It didn't sit good with Paul, and I 100% understand that. And the problem for me was I didn't want to be Paul McCartney owning John Lennon's bit of the songs. I felt that would be, like, unfair. I wanted to own my bit of the songs, but I wanted John or his estate, as it then was, to own his side of it. You know, I thought it would be perceived as a bit kind of grabby of me if I just moved in, yeah, I got all the songs. I, I wasn't comfortable with that. So what happened was I rang up Yoko, and I said, we have an opportunity to buy these songs. Ten million to you, ten million to me, and we'll, we'll have it here. And she actually said, I think we can get it for five. <laughs> 
So um, I said, well, okay, you know, let's just see what we can do. And we, we couldn't. And they went for 50 in the end. So that was what happened with me. Why you always lying? Oh my God. In late 1984, with OKs from seemingly everyone, Jackson submitted an offer for $46 million. The current owner of ATV, Robert Holmes Accord, and his team originally believed that Michael Jackson was bidding for Paul McCartney due to their obvious friendship and just released music video. Quote, Paul's people once told one of the ATV officers that their clients were interested in buying the copyrights, but that he didn't want to go through the lengthy negotiations. They said in effect, quote, you go out and get your best offer and we'll pay 10% more. So when Michael shows up, they knew he was a friend of Paul's and they suspect his bid is just a way for Paul to avoid paying the extra 10%. It took a long time to convince them that Michael was acting on his own, end quote. The sale of the catalog moved very, 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 very slowly, like slow, slow. And this was because multiple parties interested constantly debated on the price and the structure of the deal. On May 1985, Holmes Accord sent Branca a letter acknowledging that their negotiations had went way too far off course, and that he would view Jackson as an exclusive bidder for 30 days, but would find another bidder after that. Branca ignored the letter for three weeks, then responded by reminding that Michael Jackson had already made his final offer. This was all fine and dandy, and Holmes Accord went out and found another $50 million deal with another party, which was not Michael Jackson. Though John Branca was also the lawyer representing that party. Through some complicated legal work, Branca got the company to drop all of the funding. $50 million just vanished. After this, the Jackson side agreed to increase the bid to $47.5 million and a sale was finalized. A Beatles song at the time cost around $189,243. Michael Jackson bought a total of $251. Michael officially owned the Beatles. Well, mostly. One song was kept out of that deal, which was one of my favorites, Penny Lane, from the Magical Mystery Tour album. Penny Lane is in my ears and in my eyes. Holmes Accord didn't sell that because his daughter's name was Penny. Ha ha. Penny Lane. When Paul heard that his former friend now owned the rights to his songs, he was both happy and angered. You own the, the publishing rights to a whole lot of music, and not all of it is rock and roll. Some of it is Broadway stage shows, and others are mm. ballads from years gone by. But Michael Jackson has the rights now mm. to all the Beatles stuff. Mm. How much did it bother you when uh, Revolution was used to sell Nike sneakers and things like that? Heaps. Uh, yeah, you know, it was... Uh, I'll tell you why, you see. With the Beatles, we had all those offers. You know, anybody who publishes songs, you get those offers. Hey, can we use this commercial? We had the offers from the big soft drinks companies. You know who I'm talking about. Big, huge offers to use a Beatles song, to use this and that. But we always turn them down. But uh, anyone who knows music publishing, there's a lot of pressure on you to do that because it's a big heap of cash comes in suddenly and, you know, it's very hard to resist for anyone. Whoa, that, <laughs> those videos really make Ma Paul and Michael look like a divorced couple fighting over their kids, which are uh, the songs. He wrote letters to Jackson about the purchase, but Michael didn't read them because it was, quote, just business. And I defend Michael on a lot of things, but this is one thing where I cannot. I get it, business, huh? Just business, Paul. But this is stupid and one of the most despicable things, in my opinion, Michael Jackson ever did. He didn't call Paul. He didn't say, hey, Paul, let's work something out. And I, I get it. Michael owned the rights to the songs. He didn't have to. But I think there were a lot better ways he could have handled it than to say, Paul, this is just business. He could have been like, Paul, I own the rights, dude. I'll... And if he was really a friend and he was an idol because he talked about the Beatles and how much he respected them, help him out a bit, man. As mentioned in the interview earlier, Paul thought Michael would help him out with maybe a lower royalty cost, maybe even getting the catalog back, but this was not the case. Michael and Paul fell out and rarely talked again after this. They had a few pictures, but no more collaborations or anything like that. But now, really, let's get into my thoughts on this whole pickle that they were obviously in. Nobody is in the right. All Beatles, at one point or another, have said how stupid they were when it came to music publishing, and that's obviously true, seeing as what happened to their catalog. This is ridiculous. But if I had to pick a side, I guess I'd go with Michael, but that's not proudly. I don't pride being on Michael Jackson's side in the ATV purchase. He did ask Yoko and Paul's lawyer, and they said go ahead. I mean, that's good. 
but it'd be completely different if Michael bought the catalog just randomly. All in all, it was a very smart decision uh, on Michael's part to buy this, and it helped him out tremendously. I just wish Michael would have helped Paul out a little, you know? He was all he was in no way in the right with that aspect. Screw business, he was your friend and idol, you looked up to him. Not returning or even looking at the letters were quite disrespectful and a real douchebag move on Michael's part. Ultimately, I love them both and wish this crap never would have happened. Come together, right now, over me. To hear more about this and maybe go into a little more detail than a 25 minute YouTube episode, I recommend Moonwalk Talk's episode called uh, The Catalog is Mine. You can watch that, I'll link it down below. It goes really good into detail and was a tremendous help in scripting this episode. So go listen to that, it's great. I'm looking so forward to the rest of season two. Uh, things are still working out. The mic will hopefully be better, the whole cropping thing will maybe look better. Oh, that was like Remember the Time, yeah. Um, but uh, thank you guys for watching. Again, uh, big thanks to Heidel. Uh, go check out Quid. Thank you guys for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe for more. And remember, make that change. Now let's go to the super cool new outro, which features, again, the history in the mix vinyl. Make that change. Again, I don't remember if I've already said it or not. Hello, this is Michael Jackson. Thank you so much for being here. More to come. Keep checking in. Make that